All right, my wonderful students, welcome to chapter three. Before I begin, I want to just tell you a humorous story that sort of was an experience that I had in which I learned the importance of listening to instructions. Many years ago, back when I was in high school, I took an English class from a very phenomenal English teacher who also had a reputation as being very harsh. <laughs> the rumor had been spread through our school that this particular teacher had had her mailbox blown up by students using M80s and other fireworks numerous times. The rumor also existed that because of this she had replaced it with a very very strong cast iron steel mailbox or something like that. So This teacher gave us an assignment in which she instructed us to mark all of the particular parts of speech that she was focused on. I had not paid attention to the instructions properly and marked different parts of speech and as a result ended up getting a very very low grade on the assignment. The assignment wasn't that crucial for my overall grade in the semester, nevertheless I was kind of upset. So after class, I went and visited with her and I explained to her that I hadn't heard the instructions properly and according to the way I had heard the instructions, I had actually done it very, very well. She shook her head and said, Mike, I'm really, really sorry to tell you this, but you're just going to have to take the grade that you earned. So in response to her reply, and being very disappointed, I calmly said to her, my dear teacher, that is just fine, and I want you to know that I promise I will not blow up your mailbox this weekend. She looked at me and sharply replied, I'd like to see you try. It's made of three inch thick steel. So I guess I learned that the rumors were true. After today's lecture, you guys should be able to do each of the following things. Name Alkeen using the IUPAC naming system, including the Cistrans and Easy Naming Conventions. Name alkenols, molecules that have both alkenes and alcohols in them and are also called enols. Explain what reaction mechanisms are and correctly draw the reaction mechanism of adding HX to an alkene. And describe the energy diagram for adding HX to an alkene, including the meaning of the terms intermediate and transition state. And lastly, identify a compound's degree of unsaturation. With that said, let's go ahead and get started. First of all, I want to teach you how to name alkenes. Step one, name the parent chain. How do we name the parent chain? Well, we find the longest carbon chain that contains a double bond, and then we name the compound using its basic alkane names, such as methane, ethane, propane, butane, etc. But we replace the suffix ane with the suffix ene. Step two, we number the carbon atoms in the chain. Now, we always want to number in the direction that gives the double bond the lowest number. And three, we write the full name, placing any substituents at the beginning of the name and the parent chain name at the end. Let's take a look at some examples. Give the IUPAC names for each of the following alkenes. Problem one is shown here. Now you'll note in this particular example, I could number the longest chain that contains the alkene going left to right or right to left. If I number it going left to right, then the double bond starts on carbon three. If I number it going right to left, then the double bond also starts in carbon 3. So there's no difference. So how do I break the tie? Well, I do so by looking at the substituent. If I number going from right to left, then this substituent, this methyl group, is present on carbon 3. Thus, that is the direction I'm going to want to do it. Because it's a 6 carbon long chain, its parent name as an alkane would be hexane. Because it's an alkene, I change that to hexene, and because the double bond starts on carbon 3, I call it 3-hexene, or you can also call it hex-3-ene. This methyl group is found on carbon 3, thus the full name of it would be 3-methyl-3-hexene, or 3-methyl-hex-3-ene. Let's take a look at this example. It's a cycloalkene. Its parent name would be cyclohexane. In which direction do I number? Well, I want to give these two methyl substituents the lowest number. And in this particular case, it doesn't matter which direction I choose. Either direction will give me the substituents at the exact same location and the lowest possible number for my double bond, which is 1. Thus, this particular compound is called cyclohexene. I don't need to put a number for the double bond because the double bond begins at carbon 1. The substituents, methyls, are found on carbons 1 and 2. Thus, I will call it 1,2-dimethylcyclohexane. Let's look at this example. You'll note that I could number going left to right or right to left, 
the direction in which I want to number in this particular case is going to be left to right, because it gives me the lowest possible number for each of the carbons that begin my double bond. This is an interesting compound. It's eight carbons long. If it were an alkane, it would be called octane. However, it's an alkene, so we would call it octene, except it's got two alkenes in it. So how do we name that? Well, we call it octadiene. And we also have to insert numbers in here to indicate where the alkenes begin. I have a double bond beginning at carbon 2 and one beginning at carbon 5. So I would call it 2 comma 5 octadiene, or I could call it octa 2 comma 5 diene. Where do the substituents appear? At 4 and 7. So I would call it in its final name form 4 comma 7 dimethyl 2 comma 5 octadiene. And here's one last example that I'll let you do on your own.